So today we're having an ASL lecture series. The purpose of this is for professional development to help you in understand the importance of ASL, the language, and see people actually use the language as well. If you want to listen to the voice interpretation, um, there are headsets uh, available that you can pick up and listen in if you would like. Okay. So I know some people are still coming into the room, but I'm going to go ahead and start with the introduction of our guest presenter. I'm very excited um, that she could come here and present to us today. So my name is Marguerite Carrillo, and um, I uh, teach in the ASLIE department here, so I teach interpreting students. And I'm very excited to have our guest today. She's my friend. I've known her um, when we were college students. And so we've known each other for a while, and our lives always seem to cross paths. So I'm happy that she's here again to, to present to us. She's from New York City. She was born and raised there. And she came here as a college student. She had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree here as well at RIT. She um, worked at Riverside um, School for the Deaf in California uh, for almost four years. And she taught there for about four years. But uh, now she's moved back to New York City. And she's established her own business, which is very exciting. And she will share more about that business, but it's called Dame Art Studio. Um, and she has that with her art partner, uh, Gail Sanchez. And she will share more about that later. And one thing that I want you to know is that she has an Instagram account. So on Instagram, she has uh, amazing pieces on there. Um, she videos her paintings, adds music to it, and it's really great. So I really encourage all of you to um, follow her, to hear her stories, see her stories. So welcome, Mia. Mia Sanchez, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Again, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mia. This is my name sign. You might wonder why that's my name sign. When I was in California at Riverside, I tended to fingerspell my, my name again and again. M-I-A, M-I-A. And so some signs were developed, but we went on and a deaf student came up and said, I've, I've come up with this name sign for you. And they said, because your facial expressions are the bomb and you are always so friendly. And so I need to give you this name sign. So it was very touching and I've used this name sign ever since then. All right. So I am here. It is an honor to be here and to be selected to join this. And so it took me a moment to think of what I want to share. I want to show a little bit of myself and hope that that sticks with you and that can continue on to others. Taking one hour of your time really does mean a lot to me. And so I want to give you all something that you can take with you when you leave this room. And so the topic that I picked today is what color is your soul? This is not intention, intended to be religious or spiritual in any way, but it is more of who you are as a human being. Who are you inside? Also, how do you represent yourself in a variety of situations and settings in our everyday lives? And so I picked the picture that you can see, this window, this beautiful um, window, gorgeous colors over here. And I, there's a reason why I picked that picture. Growing up, my family attended church regularly. And I think a common deaf experience is often sitting in, you know, a mass or any, any setting and just looking around without access and understanding. And so for me, that actually gave me a lot of opportunity to look and examine the windows around me in the church. And oftentimes they had some artwork and it often tended to be mosaics. And so even as a young child, a, a young deaf child, I always remember seeing that and remembering that window with all of the colors. It was just amazing how its creators made a picture for us to see. 
And I realize it's been in me since then, if not before then. So the window in the church that I remember being young, we move on to uh, mood rings. Who's experienced a mood ring? Be honest, who's had one? Maybe, I think they've made earrings and necklaces, right? So you all are nodding yes. And it's very exciting to have those. I'm, I don't know, they were probably 25 cents, so cheap, but just to buy one as a child and see what color came up on the mood ring and then look at, you know, the list that they have and the feelings that you're experiencing. I remember being a child and I had no idea. I thought it was just magic. I thought like by putting this ring on, it understood me, it knows me, what I'm, it, this is amazing. But at that time, I really didn't realize that there's no battery in there. Like there's no, there's no chip, a computer chip in there. It's just a plastic ring that I have on my finger. And so at that time, this is what I thought. But as I went through my years, I was imagining how something so small, so very simple, but other magic balls, you know, eight balls that you shake to tell you an answer to a question that you posed, really all of those things rely on kind of how we define a feeling for ourselves, how we define our thoughts. So we're re relying on an external object to do that for us and how critical it is to rely on ourselves instead of those external things, knowing who we are to know what we're supposed to be doing, what we're meant to do. And so it's silly to think of as a child my excitement for this. And now as a grown woman, I know what I want. I know. I don't need this external ring to tell me what I want. Now to understand the color of your soul, we have our physical bodies here. You have your heart. And I would say between your heart and your body, your soul exists from when you were born to being raised, how you were nurtured, through a variety of, of things throughout your life. And your soul changes over time. It grows with you, just like your heart grows with you. But your soul is really how you present yourself in the mirror, how you present yourself to other people, what you say on a daily basis, what you do, and how you impact others. They might for forget your words, your actions, but they will remember how you make them feel. So I'm going to focus on the soul here. So one definition of soul searching also looks at my values, my motivations. It looks at my beliefs and my feelings. And all of that comes together to impact my behavior. And really, you need to understand you, yourself first, before you can move on and make life decisions, life choices. If you neglect yourself, you do not partake in self-care and just go through life getting by every day, I did that myself. And it doesn't go well. I have to tell you that. I had to take a break, pause, and slow down. And sometimes it's hiding because I had to take care of myself. I had to figure out what I was doing in that moment, why I was doing what I was doing, why I was even there in that moment. And so those are common questions that really are intended to look at your purpose. So in that soul searching, it gave me the ability to get out and try again and keep going. So for soul searching, I am gonna emphasize three things. Thinking, reasoning is one your beliefs, your attitudes, emotions, and memories as the second part. And then the third part here is your choices or decisions. I'm gonna expand a little bit more about the last category, the third, choices and decisions. Because it might seem like a choice and a decision is the same thing. They seem very similar, but I have to let you know that they're very different. 
the choice versus the decision, it has a huge role in how you behave, how you approach things in life. So first let's look at the word choice. It is usually things am I comfortable with? Do I like that? Maybe there's a weighing of pros and cons. And then just picking something. That's a choice. A decision, though, after you've made that choice, right? So you, you chosen what you wanted to do. Oh, I'm going to do this. This is what I may be viewing for my next part of life. But it has very little impact. The choice itself, whatever, whatever you pick from that list, the important thing is the actions thereafter, the decisions. Am I going to talk with someone? Am I going to ask for support? Where do I collect information? And then feeling good with that and then going ahead and seeing some kind of result from those actions. So the choice and the decision are very different. And in your everyday life, those happen almost immediately, all the time. We're making so many decisions about what we're going to wear to work in the morning, what we're going to eat. Maybe who should I invite to go to the movies later? It's, an, it's a daily decision that are all pretty minor in our lives. But life choices, wow, those can be crucial in impacting our life. Those are different. So I might make a decision, you know, which college will I go to? Which job should I be applying to? If they hire me, do I accept? Should I be moving to a new location? Is marriage the choice for me right now? Those large life decisions, you can get caught in a moment. But if you step back, if you take a time out, it's, it's a cost of your time. But at the same time, it's a cost of your soul. And it can impact that. And for me, it cost me a lot, the decisions that I've made. So I'm going to explain a little bit more of my personal experience and share that with you. And what I've done in my soul searching process and my life choices until today. I watched a Facebook video. Um, I, I watch a lot of inspirational videos in general. People who, to speak on different topics, and one pretty inspir inspirational video talked about the timeline of our lives. And I watched this video, and you know how people buy lottery tickets incessantly, and they just look forward, you know, and to when the numbers are pulled, and then, oh, they didn't win that tie or that time. But the video said, you know what? We are already lottery winners. We have one life to live compared to a billion people here on earth. We have it already. We already have won the lottery by being here and alive. And that, that really sunk in. It was a great concept for, for me to hold on to. And hopefully, you know, if the le average lifespan is 100 years, it might be less given other factors, but Whatever you choose to do, the age that you look forward to, that timeline, you can ask yourself, are you, are you doing enough to make yourself happy over those years? Are you doing enough to change the world? Are you doing enough even to inspire people? Do you feel like you have to do things according to what others expect? By 30, I have to be married. I have to have a new shiny car. I have to be published. I have to be in the newspaper. Is that on your timeline? Some might have later expectations. I remember seeing an article. A man of 80 years old finally graduated from college. He held his life. He put it on the back burner because he had a sick family member and took care of them. Finally went back to school and graduated at the age of 80. And that is a lifetime accomplishment. 
we might think, oh, he's too old. But for him, it meant so very much. And so that taught me really, there has to be a variety in everyone's timeline. There's nothing perfect. There's nothing exact. I remember myself feeling expectations of meeting others, their goals based on ages, but that's a society thing. And I felt very stressed and almost forced that I had to do things. And a common thing tends to be for college students is they have to pick a major, right? They have to find their job when they get into college and study <coughs> something. Within a first year, a freshman year, they're gonna take a variety of courses. They might change their major. They might not finish school. They might transfer to another school. And that's okay, that happens. And that's a message that needs to be shared. That even happened to me. I'm curious if you know this author. One of his most popular selling books is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was 1980s, I believe it was published, and it is still a number one seller. And you'll see it on the shelves if you go to a bookstore today. One of the quotes that he wrote, and I just thought it fit so perfectly with what I want to talk to you today about. You can see it up here. I am not a product of my circumstances. I'm a product of my decisions. So again, I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. So when I made the decision to come to RIT, I was 17. Grew up in a hearing family, only deaf individual in the whole family. And my family could communicate with me. I would try to read lips. They didn't sign. My relationship with my parents, you know, it often came to, you know, family planning, school, eating, but it was very, very surface level. It wasn't anything to do with life's intricacies what was going on in my psyche, what I was feeling with my emotions. So when I left to go to college, I remember my mom coming in and as I was packing, going through the list, making sure I had everything that I needed, checking off the, the list on the paper. And my mom said to me, make sure you don't come home uh, pregnant, addicted to drugs, uh, or messing up your grades. And so guess what? I got pregnant <laughs> at 19, young. So just imagine for a moment how my mom felt. I told her over TTY. Luckily at that time, I didn't have FaceTime. I didn't have to look her in the eyes when I told her. So I used the TTY to tell her. I told my mom the news and she was shocked, just taken aback. The first thing that she said was, come home. And I thought, no, I don't want to. I don't want to go home. No. Because I was under pressure of my own expectations. And I didn't want to expect to disappoint my family either. You know, what did Mia do this time was something that I didn't want to hear. I was really happy here at RIT. And the situation did impact me. I did. Um get pregnant. I was in a domestic violence relationship, but I also didn't know how to work through that. I was nervous, unsure of how to move forward. And so my mother called my brother, um, who was in the, in Iraq fighting in that war. And so my brother driving over the desert, wherever he was to a computer station to be able to sit down and connect with me via AOL you know the chats that we used to use with the little running man logo, right? You're picturing AOL and the instant messaging we used to do. That was the only way because on the phone that, that wouldn't have worked. So he was determined to talk with me. And so, you know, my mom told me, you have to go talk with your brother. Pull up AOL, get ready to chat with him. So I was bawling as I pulled it up because all of my family was far away. 
And so just seeing the messages go back and forth and he's asking me what happened. I explained, explained my situation, how I got pregnant, that I wanted to stay, but mom is trying to force me to go home. And it, it really just seemed that there was so much worry there. But I also wanted to show people that I could do, I could do it. And the first thing my brother said was, breathe, breathe, take a breath. And he said, you, my sister, I have loved you since the moment I met you. And I believe that you can do it. You know, don't abort it. Keep the baby. I believe that you can do it. Yep. He reinforced that. Please don't. You never know what's going to happen to the person if you keep, if you abort the baby. You have to keep going with that. If that individual goes, there may be more joy that, that comes from the situation when they come home and see you. So in tears, I agreed and I decided to keep the baby because I think I made a life choice within that uh, situation and I wasn't alone. I had my brother with me in that life choice. I didn't know, no one told me that, a, that single motherhood is hard. No one told me. No one told me that. There's no brochures. There's no information out there to go through college full time and take care of a baby and try to balance life to keep my passion, my involvement going, and time management. Oh, wow. There was a huge lesson that I learned from the interaction, but I did it. I graduated. I got my master's degree. I became a teacher. And I am happy that I made the decision. And I overcame that situation to show who I am and who I'm meant to be. A leader, a college graduate, a mother, and a teacher. So when you go through the soul searching process, you might think that it's simple. You think of a simple circle and start with yourself. And then you expand that to your friends and family, people who you care about. And then you expand it more to the community, your job, your school, ports, hospitals, stores, airports. And then outside of that are people. Because if there are no people, there's no community. So you need to work with people to have a community and to be involved in that kind of an experience. And then we all live on the earth. Right now, from what I'm seeing, we don't take care of the earth very well. So I'm concerned. If the earth isn't here, then that means we won't be here either. So that's the big picture. But going back to yourself, inside yourself, you have three layers. So what does that look like? Let me show you. You start with what you can control, your thoughts, your feelings, your choices, your decisions. You have the power. You have control of that circle. And if you're ready to say something or do something, it becomes influence, not just to yourself, but you're influencing others at that point. And then expanding from there is what you can't control. For example, the weather, diseases, other people and their decisions. You also can't control other people's feelings or behaviors. You can't control that. You can't control time. You can't be young forever. Eventually, you will grow older. There are a multitude of things that we can't control out there. So if you invest so much time and stress into what you can't control, then you're ignoring yourself and what you actually can control. People on social media, uh, people that you hang out with, a lot of times people are complaining. 
oh, I have to go to work tomorrow. There's going to be so much traffic. I'm not in the mood to go to work. You know, I'll late and they'll never understand because of all the traffic. So you hear a lot of complaints out there. And people don't realize that it's the little things that you tell me won't necessarily benefit me, but it's affecting you. People let problems and stress take over. And then how do you respond to that? You could say, well, maybe if you try to leave a little bit earlier, you won't be late. Or, you know, find a different route to work. Trying to work with them and find something positive out of the conversation. I've talked with a lot of people who are pessimistic. And what hurts the most is that I see a lot of students that I've taught over the last six years that already have self-doubt in them. really critical of themselves and you know they feel like they're limited they feel eh, it is what it is I've dealt with several deaf students who are like that and I finally understand the purpose of teaching In the MSSE program here at NTID it really prepped me well but they didn't prep me for the students and their experiences. That's out of my control. So when they come in my classroom, and that's something I can control. What I teach, how I plan, how I prep, how I work with them, that's things I can control. But when they're out in the world or out at home, I can't control that. So I just have to take advantage of the time that I have with them. I'm going to tell you a story about a boy at the California School for the Deaf in Riverside. And this boy was difficult. I taught special needs students, and we'll abbreviate that as N. Um, and they were a middle school age group of students. So there was one boy, uh, and he really had no motivation. Um, his family was a Mexican family, and they spoke Spanish. He had some familiarity um, with, with the culture and everything, but he just had a lack of language. So you know, I would work with him, and we worked together for about two years. He had the knowledge. He had the ability but it was just um, the actual dynamics between him and I. And we had to work together, and we worked really hard, and things started to improve for him. And he left the special needs classroom and went into a mainstream classroom. At first, we tried one class to see how it went, and then we added a second class and so on. But he kept coming into my room if he didn't understand you know, the homework or he was overwhelmed by it. And so after school, we would sit down to make sure that he was feeling comfortable in all of his classes. And then he started to come see me less and less. And I knew he was okay. I knew that he was comfortable out there in other classrooms. Now, when I left, it was really hard. You know, it felt like, oh, well, what if people forget about me? Or what if nobody cares about me? And so it was hard for him when, I, when he left the school. Um, but anyway, when he w went to eighth grade, I went back to the school and um, gave a presentation. And I saw the students, you know, who were, I had in sixth and seventh grade, and they were ready to go on to high school. After the presentation, um, you know, it was time to say all the names, give them a diploma, and everything like that. And so there was a superintendent and the principals there. And as the students went through, I saw that boy that I had struggled with and worked with for two years. And he had grown quite a bit. He was a lot taller than he was when I first worked with him. And so um, typically the students will say, you know, I love you to their family, to the teachers, and all of that. I just give a, um, brief remarks. 
And so, um, then I want to say thank you. He said, I want to say thank you to everyone. And then you pointed to me. He said, thank you. You specifically. Because without you, I wouldn't be here. I've grown so much, and I never thought that I would be able to read or write or make new friends. You know, I didn't think I would be ready to go to high school, you know, but to graduate from school and to get into college, it would be amazing. I was just tearing up. It was so touching. It was minimal in the moment, but it meant a lot to me because there was a lot of payoff for that boy. And I was just sobbing. And the superintendent is like patting my back, making sure I was all right. <laughs> so I didn't realize, you know, I can't control things in life, but in my classroom, I can do what I can. And I saw the results of that that day. So I left um, that school feeling better. You know, I didn't lose or miss anything. And he'll always be a part of my heart. So this is my timeline. Just last week, I turned 35. So you can see where I'm at right now on the timeline. I'm almost halfway there. <laughs> If I'm honest with myself, am I doing enough? What more can I do to do some more soul searching about that? I've had a long struggle and I'm not proud of everything that I've done. I've had some disappointments, some joys. I've lost friendships, I've had breakups. I've had jobs that I've had to leave. Um, I've had a lot of difficult times and a lot of difficult decisions that have impacted my life choices. And I'll explain some of them to you and how it led me here today. So these are my grandparents. They were born in the Caribbean, um, in Costa Rica and Jamaica. Um, and my father was born in Puerto Rico. The key is my grandparents here. They moved to Harlem in the late 1940s. And at that time, Harlem, it was the Harlem Renaissance. And there was a lot of immigration during that time. My grandparents shared house, a house with other um, immigrants as well. And they had to find a way to survive. In Jamaica, my grandfather was a famous poet. He was well known in Jamaica. But when he moved to New York, he was a nobody. And he worked hard doing different, different ob jo odd jobs to provide for his family. Some of his choices were not healthy. And my grandmother tried her best. She was involved with the Harlem Dance Theater and music. She went to church, played the piano. She taught ballet classes. Both of my grandparents did their best to make ends meet. There was four girls, and my mom was the youngest. And then my mom had four kids, and I was her second child. So I'm the second generation here in America. My mom is first generation, and I'm the second generation. And my mom was the first to graduate with a master's degree, and I'm the second one to graduate with a master's. And now I have two girls, so we'll see what happens there.
and I'm thankful that my grandparents moved to America because I'm not sure what it would have been like for me as a deaf, deaf female in another country. I may have missed a lot of opportunities um, and to become who I am today. I probably wouldn't be the same person if I was born in a different country. So I'm really thankful to my grandparents who make the sacrifices and move here to give my family a better life. Well, there's a picture of me and my brother. You can see the FM system I'm wearing. I hated it. Hated it so much. <laughs> so I was born hearing and then I became sick. I was very sick with scarlet fever and measles. I had a really bad case of both of them. So I had to stay home and stay in bed when I was ill. And once I finally recovered, um, and I was playing around with my brother, and my mom called us. And my brother turned and went, but my mom called me, said, Mia, Mia, and I didn't look. I was one at the time, so my mom was puzzled that I didn't respond. So she got pots and pans from the kitchen and banged them together, banged the door, stomped, and I did not turn and look at all. So my mom knew something was wrong, brought me to the doctors, and found out I was deaf. Now I'm a 1980s baby, and at that time, <coughs> There was a strong oralist tradition. You know, there was a strong emphasis on hearing and speaking. So my mom tried to find the best approach for me. And we tried a, several different um, suggestions, speech therapy, we went to audiologists. We went through the whole gamut of options. And we one put me through speech therapy and through um, work with an audiologist. And so she wanted me to have communication access, but she didn't realize that ASL was also critical. And it wasn't her fault. She was just trying her best to make sure that I was in both worlds. And so in elementary school, we were looking for interpreters, but I had to lip read an interpreter. And after lunchtime, when, you know, you were eating, and then you would play, and then you had to sit there and read lips. I don't remember the teacher. I don't remember the classmates. I remember the interpreter's mouth. That's what I remember, because I was staring at the interpreter's mouth so much. I lacked social experience. I lacked involvement. And so my mom was looking for an interpreter who could sign, and then came and sat in front of me, signed and I wasn't used to it. I said, you know, I depend on lip reading and I didn't understand the signs. So the interpreter was very patient and working through it. She wasn't just an interpreter, she actually became my friend and became a mentor for me, teaching me about deaf culture, um, deaf and hard of hearing people as well. I said, you know, there's a deaf president, Gallaudet, I King Jordan. And she explained that deaf can do ev deaf people can do everything except for here. And so she just taught me so much. I had a kindergarten class and I said that I, she said that I could sign a story to the class. She was just trying to help me appreciate my deaf ad identity. So I'm really grateful to that interpreter for all she did to make sure that I knew what my role, not just as a person, but also as a deaf person. So I also thank my mom for looking for somebody to interpret for me. And then for that interpreter, just willing to go above and beyond. And while I went through that, my eyes had to work so hard. And my brain was just exhausted from those experiences. And I found my passion in art because it was comfortable. 
I was able to express what I, uh, myself when I couldn't find the right words. If I couldn't find the right way to explain something, I would just use art to express myself. So I did a lot of speech, listening, and art. I did them both at the same time, and they've been in me for a long time. And reading as well. Books are my best friend. I read a lot. Even if a family would go to our family would go to the movies, I'd ask for the name of the movies. I'd find a book related to that movie, and then I'd read it before I went because I didn't have captions on my movies. So I would read the book and then go watch the movie. And the odd part, I'd say, "Oh yeah, I could tell the story," but it wasn't in the movie, and it was in the book. So I knew more than my family by reading the book than from them watching the movie. And so I really benefited from reading all of those books. So I want to explain a little bit more about my own deaf experience. I was mainstreamed, never went to a deaf school, and so relied on interpreters every year until graduation. Of course, I had good and bad interpreters. <coughs> it doesn't mean that they didn't love their jobs. That's not what I'm intending here. But some of them were newer, and they were trying their best. And I accepted the range that I saw. And I think interpreters are the key in our community. Without them, how we express ourselves, how we hear, how access is provided and how we gain access to the information. So I have high respect for interpreters. Even, even though I'm a, a proud deaf inv individual, without interpreters, I don't think I'd be recognized enough. So thank you for the interpreters that are here in the room with us. The movie that you see here, we've seen these movies, right? Sound and Fury. Wow, let's talk about that video. I didn't meet a lot of deaf individuals. I watched that movie, saw the difference of the families, their approaches, the decision for a cochlear implant, the decision uh, for the deaf father and how he was so torn up about that and how he felt excluded and put down and how the deaf father, the baby and the second one, his brother, I've never seen so much emotion that happens within one movie. The conflict and controversy. It really made me think about my own anger, my own disappointment, fear, desire even maybe to be hearing. So that movie really made me question who I am as a deaf person. Should I be mad at my family because they don't sign? Maybe because I don't speak clearly enough or well enough, because I'm not deaf enough. It really took some soul searching and some, some self-identifying about what's going on. I'm not going to hit a CI. I'll rely on my hearing aids. I'll speak. I'll sign. I'll find a way to navigate the world. And I met some people that said, oh, you know what? You're a deaf person, but you might as well be a hearing person and how you behave. I went to the youth leadership camp, and of course, wow, the deaf individuals there, it was a culture shock for me. They are known for their sports, you know, schools of the deaf, deaf families, and here I was thinking, where do I fit in? Where do I even belong? And there was an activity that was trivia about deaf history, and so there were teams that knew the answer. They knew their stuff. I had no idea. So they would call on me and ask me a bunch of questions. And I didn't know how to answer. They were like, come on, this is easy. This is the answer. My self-esteem was crushed from attending that. I came to camp to learn. I didn't come here to impress anybody. So social peer pressure at that time was overwhelming. I made it through, I made some friends. 
I began to understand more and pick up on things. I can become a leader. And so from that camp, it was a tough experience in the moment, but I think it was one of the best experiences I've had as a deaf person for my deaf experience. That's my dream school, <laughs> Fashion Institute of Technology. I love art. I look up to FIT. It's in New York City. I want to go to that school so bad. I was taking Saturday classes every Saturday for a year. I took everything that I could. It was thousands of people that apply to gain admission to that college. And they limited it to 500. And so my thought was, that's fine. But you know what? I have to show up and do different tests. It's like the quality of the art that you can produce, a lecture, an essay. So I did all of that and got my place within the school. And I was hoping, waiting. I got a letter back of acceptance. And I was thrilled. Showed my mom, I want to go there. I got in. And my mom said, nope, you're not going to that school. RIT is better. And I was like, RIT? What? Why? And she said, nope, they have both hearing and deaf students there. You have full access available, and the reputation is stellar. And I said, no, but FIT too. We went back and forth. And at that time, I have to respect my mother. I did. And so she made the choice for me. Maybe she knows better than me, but I accepted it. I backed down from that conversation and said, we'll go ahead with RET. And today, I still wonder, again, what my life would have been like if I went to FIT. And I'm not sorry, I don't regret it, but it could be different. It could be. Got into RET, had a baby, continued on. Again, persistent, wasn't giving up. My best memory of RIT was a program called uh, Global Reach Out. We tended to call it GRO. And so it asked for deaf volunteers to go to another country, um, but it was more of like workshops and activities to learn about that country, right? And the goal was to empower the people that lived there. So I went to India for a month, and that was 2007. And then I went to Thailand for two weeks in 2008. And the experiences were so impactful. When I got out of those and left to see deaf people in their own countries, especially what we would call a third world country, it is so much harder on them, their daily lives, than we have it here. It really made me realize that I am fortunate for what I have here. And doing all of that work, I loved it. The person who set up this one, I am so thankful for them because of the opportunity they gave to all of us that attended to go through and interact with deaf individuals across the world. So if you're curious or are considering applying, I would tell you to do it. It is so worth it. I think that they accept individuals up to the age of 30. So if you're under 30, take advantage of that. So I graduated in 2008. It was a bad time to graduate. <laughs> so Wall Street crashed. People lost jobs. The economy crashed. Businesses shut down. So as I got ready to leave RIT and felt good about graduation, there were no jobs available. Great, what am I supposed to do now? So I decided to come back to RIT for my graduate degree. I was gonna become a teacher. I knew that would be a guaranteed job. So I said, all right, I'm coming back to RIT and that's gonna be my choice. I'm gonna go back to school. Graduated, became a teacher because I knew that I would have job security and it would be a stable environment for my daughter. We would have the same schedule, I would have reliable pay. 
So I just talked about um, all of the things that I would do for others, right? I haven't mentioned anything about me yet. I haven't done anything for myself at this point in time. I'm doing a lot for others. I have to do something for myself, and I finally realized that. So I moved to California. <laughs> My family was upset, but I didn't care. I moved. I had to move. I had to try to get out. I had to find work, and I could work at the California School for the Deaf. So I taught at RSD for a, a brief moment in time. They did offer me a, a position, and I don't regret my decision, but I went to California and worked for four years. So in California, I had a job, I have a home, got married, second baby, life was good. My husband's from Japan, wanted work, wanted to go back to New York City for better opportunities. He's a tattoo artist. So I agreed to go back to New York. I left my job, I left my home, got to New York City, uh, shared, shared a family, or a home with a family. So I wanted to take care of my little one, make sure my husband could work. And he fell into his job. He became married to his job, basically. No longer married to me in the same way. And so the best decision was to become separated. I, I don't want to hate him. I respect him. In the culture and where he's from, you are married to your work. You are dedicated in that way. So we've decided the best thing to do is to separate. But now what do I do? What are my life choices now? So I had to set up a business. So we can notice concerns happening around, but in the moment what I do or what I decide will influence what's happening. Should I let that external concern and issue control me or do I control it? Do I control what's going on around me? And you know what, I'm proactive. Whatever's happening that I cannot control, I can move through, I can work. So situations have come up I accept them and I find a way to make it work. So you really have to think about, don't let the concerning, stressed out behavior take over you. Find a way to make yourself happy. Make yourself successful. On the left, the picture of me and my business partner, Gail. She also came to RET. We decided that we were going to start up a, an art business, and I'm thankful for her for making the decision with me. We made it together. My daughter is on the right when she was younger. <laughs> so she went to a CODA camp. My daughter's hearing, but she wanted to make sure that she knew she was a CODA. And so the first time she was a little worried to go, but I thought, you know what, I went to youth leadership camp. For a month, you'll be fine. So she was very nervous. I kept encouraging her. It's good for you. Go, go, go. So this is her camp counselor, Casimir Clark. And she took care of my daughter, supported her through every moment. And she said, you know what? I love her, her energy, everything she brings. And it was just like she gets what it is like to be a CODA. And so we ended up working in the same place, California Riverside. And so we were actually in the same hallway and saw each other. What a, what a wonderful coincidence, her energy. And I thought, you know what? We looked the same and acted the same, but people often thought we were sisters just because of the similarities we shared. She texted me last year and said, I know that you know you left Riverside but we should have a family fun weekend. We should do art for the auction. Would you be willing to donate? She's like, come on, come on, let's do this, you know? I'll keep reminding you every day until you send me something. So I agreed, made her a piece and sent it on. Because of her, she really helped me break through my journey as an artist. 
More people asked for more pieces, so I began to paint more. I haven't even mentioned that, but I was so stressed that because of her, she convinced me. This is now time to put your art out there for the world to see. And ever since then, I am so thankful for the two of them for making me able to become the artist that I am. My aunt, Inez, Alexander, with my second daughter. <laughs> when I went back to New York, I see her and got a chance to spend time with her. She has a brain tumor. She's had it for probably 15 plus years at this point in time. She's still doing well. When I moved back, I could see her body basically was maxed out. I asked her, you know, how are you overcoming this, this long struggle? Well, the doctors told me I had six months to live, but I wasn't going to hear that. I was going to travel. She does not have a husband, no children, but she was going to go out and live her life and full of love, full of energy. And she beat cancer for quite some time until her body just hit the, the maxed out and she passed away this last February. But she made her life worth living. She couldn't control cancer, but she could control her daily choices and that's what she did. Now moving over, a friend of mine from Riverside, same age as I am, was involved, volunteered, supported students, hilarious. Saw him this last summer, visited California when I was there. Last month, passed away. Of course, I wondered what happened and learned. Doctors said, oh, it's, it's pneumonia. But coughing lasted a lot longer, was pretty exhausted, went back to the doctor several times. On the third visit, ended up staying. Had stage four cancer. No, that, that couldn't be. Maybe, maybe a lung transplant. Maybe some other options. And so fought from that diagnosis. His best friend, his family members, sat down with him and said, you are going to die. Just sign the paper. And so the doctor, when they said stage four cancer, he died the same week. This person was full of life. Wanted to take care, take over the world and beat it, but he wasn't given the time. So when I compare these two individuals, my aunt who beat cancer for as long as she physically could, and a friend that was told and then passed within a week, both are gone. But they both taught me a lot. You have to use your timeline wisely. Uh, this is what I've been doing for the past year. All of this. <laughs> Traveling a lot, different organizations, representing my business. I use my time um, full-time mom, still pursuing full-time work to get all of this done. And this has happened within a year. And I have more opportunities to come. I donate my art to these organizations. I travel, visit deaf schools, that's, I study art. It's worth it to me. Last week, my 35th birthday, I decided to have an art show. I essentially put myself out there because I've neglected my joy, my passion. I decided at 35, I was gonna have an art show. People came, celebrated with me, and it was such a gift to myself, and I'm so happy that I did that. And so it was a kickoff for more to come, doing more for myself. Right? 
right? <laughs> this is the perfect example of that. It's okay. This actually looks more fun on the right. There's more stories that come along with that. Yeah, keep that in mind. It is okay to go on a journey that you didn't expect, but know that you will get there. Don't give up. So, what color is my soul? What color is my soul? What color? I'm a colorful mess. I can't pick one color. I can't. You know, psychology has different colors, so the, the psychology of colors. When I go home, when I go to work, to a meeting, in the store, here at RIT, there are multiple colors, and that's okay. When I'm at home, I might be green. When I might be at school, I might be red. I might be blue somewhere else. There's no way that we can pick just one color. So be your own rainbow. People say, oh wow, you know, you used to be so quiet, you used to be so serious, now you're out there. What is wrong, what's changed? I've grown, I've changed, and I'm okay with that. I do not have to stay the same person. I'm not a robot. If you notice something, that means I'm doing something right. People say, oh, you know, you're not like you used to be. Well, thank you, is my usual answer. Again, because it means I'm doing something right. It's okay. So, whatever you do, breathe. <laughs> Take the time to look deeper into yourself. When you come out again, you keep going. And only be kind. Everyone struggles. I still struggle. But if you be kind, that costs nothing. It's free. Whatever you do in your very busy life, take the time to appreciate sunsets, sunrises, your favorite ice cream, nature. It's the small things. <laughs>